How are we today, everyone? I'm your host, Tyler Coe. Welcome in for another episode. Episode number eight, I believe. This is my mental health show, and however you got here, I'm happy you're here. You can find recorded versions of this show on YouTube, iTunes, and Spotify, plus a bunch of other audio platforms. We do the show live on Twitch every single Monday at 7 p.m. Central Time here in the States, with the VOD being released uh, immediately after the end of the show, which can be seen on the show page. Reminder that this is September here on Twitch, and if you'd like to subscribe to the channel, it is currently 20% off for the remainder of the month, which I would like you guys to do because I want you to save your money, but if you do want to support this channel, now would be the month to do it uh, so we don't cost you too many dollar bills. Um, So excited to have everybody in today. As you can see today, we're going to be talking about creativity and mental illness. Is there a link? I'll kind of move over so you, you guys can see that if you're watching. We're going to be discussing that today. Um, I know here on this channel in doing this show when it comes to creativity um, and as difficult as it has been sometimes in the past couple months, you know, obviously doing this by myself uh, and trying to get this up and running, um, it really has been fulfilling my creative side, specifically in the lead up to the show. The rest of the week, my gosh, I'm kind of like all over the place, Uh, but, you know, planning it out to an extent, giving myself areas in the show to let it breathe and just kind of do improv and let's just kind of see what happens and as much as I hate my bipolar disorder I secretly and I guess now publicly because I'm about to say it uh, I can express that I do know that it has at moments in my life enhanced my abilities when it comes to being creative and you know there's long been the terms There's been the terms going back to the times of Greek philosophers, of the mad genius. You know, we are all familiar in our own time of the tortured artist. And I think most of us are familiar with those people throughout mankind that we know we're a little bit off, if you will, touched, um, if you want to say it that way. But it's funny because recent studies have shown that there might actually be a correlation, that there might actually be a link between creativity and mental illness. Now, let's throw out a bunch of disclaimers right away, okay, before I lose all you guys. Um, No, you don't have to be mentally ill (laughs) to be creative. Uh, If you do have a mental illness, that does not make you more creative than anybody else. You might not be uh, creative at all. Creative people don't have to be mentally ill. So there's a lot out there. But there have been recent studies that show that there might actually be a link. Might. Um, So... There are some studies that say yes. There's some studies that say no. There's ones like in 2015, there was a research study uh, done in the Netherlands that analyzed the DNA of more than 86,000 people to look for genes that increase the risk of bipolar and schizophrenia. They also noted whether the individuals worked in or were associated with creative fields, you know, dancing, acting, uh, music, writing, all that stuff. They found that creative individuals were up to 25% more likely the non-creative people to carry genes that were associated with bipolar and schizophrenia. Now to counter that, there are multiple studies with massive, massive data collection that points to there not really being that big of a correlation, that it's minute, that it, that really doesn't pan out. But to counter that one, there have been studies that shown that even though a creative person might not have a mental illness, for some reason, overwhelmingly, a sibling or relative of theirs will have mental illness and will overwhelmingly be in the creative field. So the whole point of this and why I'm kind of bringing this up is because I really want to have a positive episode today. Not to say that our our past episodes haven't been positive. I always try and leave you guys a little bit of positivity and you know that. But I think today I want to talk about the positive side of having a mental illness and using, if you will, symptoms and afflictions for your betterment. Because I think with all of this stuff that I just talked about, I think that it, it, we should highlight the fact that there actually is statistical proof that there are some, and while that, again, is subjective, there are positives to having a mental illness. That doesn't mean go try out and get one, right? Uh, but it means that there can be. And it's hard to overlook the fact that some of the, the great minds of our time, a lot of them have suffered from a mental illness. Beethoven, Virginia Woolf, Kanye West, Hemingway, Isaac Newton, uh, Jackson Pollock, all of them have bi- had bipolar disorder or have it. Was it, was that, you know, why they were great? 
was due to that? You know, obviously that's very debatable. Michelangelo suffered from extreme depression and Charles Dickens. Van Gogh might have been schizophrenic. And you think of all the amazingly talented people on the spectrum that have exhibited amazing creativity and imagination throughout mankind. And while these, you know, all these talented people and then their mental illness, in the context of that, maybe it's not really their mental illness that gave them those gifts, but perhaps it was the symptoms that allowed them to enhance those things. As I know for me personally, for my bipolar, which has given me the ability, if you will, to use some of my symptoms in a positive way and certainly in a creative way, I know that my delusions of grandeur have led me to be bold. That's led me to be daring. That's put me in some pretty creative spots and unique positions. I know that my obsessive thoughts have led to extreme uh, periods of time where I have relentless focus. You know, the, the drawings and I, the note cards and the strings attached on the wall. I've been in those moments, and I, and I definitely think that is a little bit because of my bipolar. Could it be just my natural drive and ambition? Maybe. But I think that's what I want to talk about today. And how can we wield that power, right? If that is the thing that we can do, can we wield the power of our symptoms that we suffer with and make it into something productive? Because I think it's something we all naturally hear about all the time when it comes to like people that go to rehabs or uh, retreats. What do they have you do? We want you to draw. Go to a pottery class. Uh, let's have you paint. Let's have you create. Let's have you make. Tap into your mind that might not be that broken after all because there's some pretty cool things up there. Um, so it's a double-edged sword, and at least it is for me, and it might very well be for you. Um, obviously, with the extremes come cost, and you can fall victim to them. I certainly have had my manic moments that have spun me into an obsessive corner that I cannot get out of. It can be dangerous. It can also be beautiful. So on today's show, I'm bringing on somebody um, that very much can <laughs> – speak to this and I, I she can speak to a, a variety of different things and she's definitely without a doubt one of the most creative people that i i have ever met in my life um in fact we just had coffee i believe it was like last week and i just kind of sat there in awe listening to everything that she's been working on what she has been working on and just her creative mind is something truly unique so she is a jack of all trades uh dangerously talented with the chainsaw so I want to welcome her on today, and that is my very good friend, Griffin Ramsey. Griffin, how are we today? Hold on one second. That sounds like a good meal. That's, you know, I, haven't, I don't think I've ever actually had a chicken dumpling in my life. I know that, that might just be a shocking thing. I don't know if we just need to break that down real quick before we get into the show. <laughs> it, it might um griffin i'm so excited to have you on the show today um one second hold on hold on hold on one second goodness gracious you know we always run into issues on the show and it's mainly because of my fault so we're gonna start that over again because i had you muted in the wrong area i think you're good to go now <laughs> thank god i have chat so griffin okay. griffin how are we today I'm doing well. Um, I don't know that you want me to repeat everything I just said. I don't know. Do you want me to? No, you don't <laughs> have to. No, we're off to a rip roaring start. Good God, Tyler, get it together. I'm. Uh, things are good today. I've been uh, definitely doing some self care. I took a nap, okay. uh, making chicken dumplings. So uh, house smells nice and warm and brothy. That's good to do. That's good to have. I know that I could probably work on my aesthetic because I, I still continue to live in a shack. Um, but um, I'm really excited to have you on today because, uh, uh, like I said, you know, we just recently uh, hung out to grab coffee and kind of just catch up. And um, we kind of got into this conversation about creativity and, you know, could could a mental illness actually influence this in a positive way because we're always kind of talking about the negatives on the show not purposely but making sure people get educated can understand kind of what they're going through um so kind of just listening to me talk uh at the top about all this stuff what do you think do you think there is a link between creativity and mental illness or is it just kind of dependent upon the person and who they are naturally well i'm gonna um be a contrarian and just say that i think that sometimes uh it's always the way these things are described 
are coming from a perspective that isn't creative creativity like creativity friendly if that makes sense like it's like the people living in this sort of creative lifestyle doing creative work often are being described by people who are living in a lot more of a type a scenario and think that that is normal and um i think that it's maybe a combination where people who suffer from mental illness can find a lot of relief and joy and meaning by processing through creativity. But I think a lot of it has to do also with just these people you're mentioning who have suffered from depression, like Michelangelo. Who the hell did Michelangelo even have to talk to then? Who was on his level that was like thinking these things or having these like feelings or moments, you know? Like it could be a form of isolation through being a little ahead of your time. I don't think that people that were ahead of their time in their fields that we were really making strides in necessarily had a lot of camaraderie in the general population around them. I know that sounds snobby, but this is a new way to look at it. <laughs> no, I mean, it's true. And you think about it, what does isolation do to somebody in their mental health? I mean, it can definitely affect it in, in a multitude of different ways. Um, the stories with, yeah. uh, with Isaac Newton and how he actually came to discover gravity is because a friend now, this is a story. I'm not sure how 100% true this is, but apparently a friend came over to talk to Isaac Newton about something else and saw him working away on just a, you know, God knows what, and asked him about, hey, what's this thing you got working on over here? And he's like, oh, it's just gravity. And he's like, excuse me, what is that? And like, that's how we have that is because of a mistake. This person was just kind of off on their own without any connections. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, it's isolation, but I think also just like, to call every kind of uh, outside of the box think thinker mentally ill because other people are having a hard time processing them. I mean, the thing that kind of kills me, especially in the society we live in now, first of all, let's just look at the met the world of the history of medicine and how many times somebody who is a little unusual or gay or really hating her husband or whatever were diagnosed as being like mentally ill, you know, like how often is it just because we're not so easy to deal with, we might be super feelers. Or, you know, we have us, we need a sense of meaning. And uh, look at how, I'm going all over the place here, but how well sociopaths tend to do at being successful driven people that succeed in the framework that the society gives them. Are they better people for that reason? Just because they can like work with the rules and not have any like, don't get thrown off by their emotions. You know, like, I don't know. I think that sometimes being more connected makes you more creative. And it also makes you more miserable sometimes, you know? We've talked about that a lot. We talk a lot about on the show about compassion fatigue and just being able to be that provider for everybody and just getting too sucked into everybody else's life. Even if it's filled with positivity, yeah, you do, you do need to kind of step back and step away. So that's a really interesting perspective. And I think you're right. I mean, we've talked about uh, too about how people exactly like you said back in the Middle Ages, if they were a little off, they weren't. They were just themselves, but we didn't know how to process that. We didn't know how to understand that. So we labeled that person as mad. They were crazy. They're the town loon. Um, and that, or I like, look at the, look at the, uh, the history of lobotomies. How many people got a lobotomy because they were a little bit too sexual for their family's comfort or mm -hmm. whatever? You know, like they got lobotomized for that. And that was considered like the right thing to do. So I think that in general, here's the thing. I like to have a healthy dose of skepticism around all figures of authority, especially ones that are trying to tell you that your nature is wrong and you should feel bad about it or change it to fit in better with them. Absolutely. Sorry, I'm going to be a kind of an annoying person about this. And I'm not, this isn't just all the self-denial in the world about, you know, my mood swings. <laughs> <laughs> like I... I have definitely suffered from huge moments of very big stretches of depression, but they often coincided with life circumstances that I couldn't control that sucked for me. And it might have been like easier for everyone around me, for me to medicate myself to become happier with the circumstances that I wasn't happy with, but then I would have lacked more of the drive to change them. You know? Absolutely. Um, so it's also... also Go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but before I forget, you know, I did give you a better title for this episode, which was Delusions of Grandeur, Making Mania Work for You. I mean, that's just what's up on the board, creativity and mental illness. <laughs> we can label the uh, the episode Delusions of Grandeur, Making Mania Work for You. It's um, just snazzy. It, it's way better. It really isn't. It sounds more fun, too. Mania, I mean, think of like, what was it from the Maenads or whatever, like just wild, divine inspiration. Divine inspiration, Joan of Arc, here's the voice of God, you know, does great, crazy things, you know, like touched, but that's also the perspective of somebody saying that's bullshit and the voice they're hearing isn't real. 
I mean, yeah. I don't know. It's all a matter of perspective and how you want to interpret the reality that we're given. And I think that's the, the biggest thing is trying to try to manage your own reality when your brain physically is trying to distort it. I mean, it's really difficult to do. Um, and uh, I kind of wanted to ask you this as well, because I think this really plays into it when we're talking about depression, we're talking about self-doubt that Sylvia Plath once dropped a truth bomb. Uh, and I think it really affects all of us in this regard. But the worst enemy of creativity is self-doubt. So like when your depression hits, uh, you know, periods of life that uh, are extremely successful and then you have years where not a damn thing is making you move or or want to get up. What have you done in those situations that you just kind of mentioned as far as like going through those states? What have you found to help you out and get you out of those? Or maybe even if not that, just maintain and keep yourself up. Well, so um, I try, that's the thing. It's like, do I consider that myself like a crippled individual because I have mood swings? No, they've been my whole life. This is the way I experience life. And granted, it sucks to be on the downside, but the highs, the highs that I've had, I, when I talk to people sometimes and I try to describe these moments of euphoria in my life where I felt so, I felt like I was, I mean, this is the delusion of grandeur. I felt like I'd, I could reach out and just manipulate the universe with my will. And in a lot of ways, it worked with that confidence and belief in myself. And that is manifestations or, you know, setting your intentions in psychology. If you want to get all scientific about it, I think it's all the same. But, you know, like you can move mountains with a vision and belief in yourself. And if you have a heightened moment of that, that could be considered mania. And if, you know, we're listening to the people saying that this is a wrong thing to experience or we should be tamping that down, like I would, I don't know what that would have done to my career. And the favorite moments of my life may never have happened because I may never have like stretched myself out that way. But to get back to your point about how I manage it, um, I try to keep my momentum up and partly why I'm sort of a chaotic mess when it comes to having too many projects. And I think a lot of creative people feel this way. We have more ideas when we're too busy to do anything with them. And that's because we have that energy moving. And so if I start to like feel lagging or like depressed about a project or I'm hitting a wall with something, then I'll bounce off to the other thing. And I kind of just that way, a little bit of a difference or a change is like a vacation, but you're still making, you're still being productive. And so trying to keep the productivity up though there are moments of extreme depression like 2020 was awful and I had all the time in the world that I wanted finally I kept saying I wanted time to do all these things and then when I had the time I had no energy and I was just depressed and we weren't you know no one was talking or hanging out and there's there's tricks to creativity too that well we're we just talking about creativity or just happiness or getting out of bed in the morning what it's, do you I mean it's a little bit of both I mean creativity when it comes to like if that is your life which it is for a lot of people you know especially a lot of our viewers that is their field so it's their job it's their livelihood but it's also about that energy to just get up I think so many of us and I think you touch on something that I guarantee you resonates with everybody is like having the creativity in 2020 and having that mindset of being able to like move forward was damn near impossible I don't care who you are like it was so tough to do yeah it was really difficult um, but then some, some moments that came out of it were really good. And I think that came through the slowing down, like, um, in 2019, I felt like for my business in particular, chainsaw carving. And at that time I was doing a ton of live shows and, uh, demonstrations and, um, mostly like art as performance. Cause I was finding I was making better money doing that. And I had more like personal joy in it. I, I liked that more than commissions and everything, partly because, I'm really social and I get energy from eyeballs and attention. And so as much as I don't really consider myself an actor, I do love like performance because having the audience there gives me the energy coming off of them to like finish things, especially on a deadline. Um, so 2019, I was like packed my schedule so much thinking that I was going, that I was making really good money, that I was like, you know, my career, kicking ass at career and everything. But by the end of the year, I was so burned out. I couldn't be nice to my clients. I was mad at myself for packing my schedule that way. And when I looked at my profit and loss, I really, as much as I brought in, a, you know, a pretty decent amount of money for me for, as an artist, I barely cleared any of it because I was like paying late fees on everything or hiring extra help or last minute plane tickets, last minute everything, which costs more. And so in 2020, being forced to slow down, granted, a lot of that, I was just watching endless amounts of television from my bed and, you know, struggling to move. But but it, but slowing down did allow me in some ways to really make some jumps ahead of my career because I was able to like take time and negotiate, just work on the fewer things and negotiate better deals. And then I was happier with my clients and like things in general went better and smoother. And that was a great thing for me to observe. 
Because as much as I love to pack my schedule and keep the energy going, like uh, there's a detriment to that too, because you can get burnout. So, and that may be where that mania gets a little tricky because you can really burn yourself out if you're on like a, a long stretch. And when it comes to these, like, especially freelancing, you have feast and famine and people are afraid of the famine, but I get scared of the feast sometimes when everything happens at the same time and trying to get it done without dropping any balls. And that can be a lot of pressure. And the famine is the vacation. So, but the problem with, you know, freelancing or anything is just that the famine is like you get your vacation and then immediately you're guilty and worried about it, you know? And you talked right there about like that kind of that burnout, that overwhelming. Um, there's so many people that kind of go through that, whatever they're going through in their lives with that. And it kind of seems to be the way that life is moving. I don't know if that's just me. And I, I know we're both in a creative field, but it does seem to be kind of like you have the doldrums and then everything just drops on you at once. And it's mm -hmm. really hard to manage that burnout. Like, are there are there little things that you do uh, when you get to that point? Do you ever, like, give yourself time? And I mean, like, literally, like, during the day, if you had just, like, a morning filled with meetings that were just, it was too much, too much overlap, do you ever give yourself, like, 30 minutes or an hour to just do literally nothing? Um, yeah, totally. Like, actually, the thing I really love about freelancing as a creative person um, versus like working in an office doing graphic design or something is that I can control the priority of things. And I like that because I work with my energy levels. And then if I hit that lull, then I have to, you know, yeah, you know, I have certain things that I'll push up to the priority that have certain deadlines. But then if the energy lags, you know, those little things that can wait a bit, they can wait a bit, you know, and then that gets tricky sometimes because sometimes my clients get annoyed with me because I, I'm not always great at the, um, responding to emails immediately or, you know, getting really motivated and some people have to wait a long time for things, but that's, that's typical of artists in general. You know, if you're hiring an artist for something, you tip can, a lot of people say that they had to wait a year for a thing to get back to them, you know, because we're working with like a, a finite supply of this thing that we're constantly having to trick ourselves into creating, you know, Kind of, I mean, sort of, but then when, you know, you take a break and it starts to fill up automatically and then you, there are tricks. And um, part of this comes from the artist's way, which is like a really good resource if you're feeling blocked or if you are what she calls like a shadow artist, which is someone who feels really creative or pulled to creative things, but doesn't have the confidence to call themselves an artist yet. And sometimes they get into this weird shadow world or supporting somebody else. Somebody who's got a little bit more and more comfort saying that they're an artist and they, it's like a kind of a frustrating position for them. So her name is, uh, what is it? Julia Cameron called the artist way. And a lot of that, so she's a recovering alcoholic. She talks a lot about that where she was using alcohol to try to get, uh, get comfortable to get into her creative space. But that was like a closing window that she would have to get work done before she was too drunk to get anything done. Um, so that was interesting because she was monitoring her own, like how she would get into the creative space, but then she knew it was a limitation by the trick she used. And so, um, but then this book sort of came out of her, how does she work without this, magic feather, you know, and then uh, she found a way to sort of get other people inspired tricks to get you kind of inspired. One of the things she really recommends is um, daily pages. First thing in the morning when you wake up, just write stream of consciousness. No, it doesn't have to mean anything. Anything can be list anything, but just first thing before your brain starts to settle on all of your responsibilities and the things that weigh you down, just do some auto writing. And I guess if you're more visual, you could do doodling, but I guess the essentially it's like before your brain gets busy with like problem solving shit, you want to let like just the pure, just came out of dream state stuff flow. And then her other thing is that once a week, you should take yourself on an artist state, which is you do something just for you to go and kind of inspire some creativity that could be like a walk in nature, go to an art museum, go see one of your friend's shows or whatever, you know. Oh, that's a trick that I have. Sorry, I'm kind of on a, on a tear now. Getting wound up. <laughs> no, this is great. No, our audience is loving this. They're already going off in the chat about, I got to buy that book. So keep going. Oh, it's keep great. It. it is great. And I will say it was the thing I liked about that book. It was, I got it in college for a movement class. In, but I've, I've gone back to it again and again. And I've gone back to the techniques. I don't need the book so much. So she has some cool quotes from different creative people that are inspiring. I liked that it was like practical, easy to do, concrete things you could do to trigger the creative spirit. It's not this mystical force that might be a mystical force. I'm not convinced it isn't, but you know, like everything is sort of wants to create, you know, like everything is, we're all like matter. It's like kind of amazing that anything exists in the first place. And I get kind of wound up thinking about all this stuff. And that's sort of why I think 
yes, like I, sh I don't don't be in denial if you need help about your mental illness, but also be careful who's calling it that and why. And yes, you can read all the WebMD and uh, yes, go and get help if you need it. Everyone, honestly, I think needs a therapist to survive in the world now. Yes. You know, like we all should have some resource that's not going to burn out our friends and family that's unbiased to go to if we can afford it. Um, whether or not everyone needs to medicate all their problems away just to make themselves docile, quiet creatures that doesn't bother anybody. I mean, that's up to you. What kind of personality you want to have. But if you want to set the world on fire, you know, with your great ideas, I, maybe you shouldn't numb them too much. Well, it's funny. But I this is my opinion. I know I'm probably going to have about a bunch of backlash in there. No, not at all. I think, uh, no, people want raw. And I mean, that's one of the reasons I I've, I wanted you on the show and we've had other guests is to really speak to it because I, I think that's the thing that's left out with mental illness. And then I want to go back to something you talked about um, as far as kind of like that creative window. But too often, it's just so much about the negative. You have to get medicated to do that. That's That's all you can do. This diagnosis is now your personality. And I frankly think that's bullshit as well. Uh, there are so many things you you have to do, and it half when it comes to mental illness, is kind of harsh. Like you have to do these things, but you do to combat it. And creativity yeah. is such a huge outlet for that. Calling it everything that's abnormal in illness versus different brain chemistry, you know, like yeah, it's like assigning a value to it, and it's like. It might, it is easier, they, it, it's been shown to be easier for people to, if people who fit in with the standards of the society or the culture that they live in tend to lead happier lives. But if you don't fit in with that, is the goal to normalize yourself to fit in with it so you lead a happier life? Or is it to try to find yourself in the special way that you are and express it or find your people, find your real tribe or whatever you know and then that's the thing i have moments long stretches of depression but i can point to exactly why i'm depressed because i have thought about it and they're real life circumstances and yeah like you know i know people get help in those moments i probably should have in some moments especially the longer they lasted gotten some help just to get myself out of bed to be productive but that's another thing too productive like we in america really prioritize this idea of productivity the germans do too it's like a cultural thing that comes from the puritan side where we assigned holiness with constant work and one thing we learned in 2020 was that you know people slowed down they reprioritized their lives and they a lot of them decide i'm not going to go work for this fucking bullshit wage you know it like doing this thing that kills my soul for like no money you know like and now they're having to rethink everything and hopefully they're able to in that realization by slowing down and not being hyperproductive to where they couldn't think because their schedule is packed to, to find a better sense of themselves or how they would reflect the self they wanted to reflect, you know, instead of just like keeping up the grind, you know, because the grind, yeah, the grind's not going to lead you anywhere. And I think what you said about kind of like finding your people, that was literally about to be my next question. And you already answered it because I've always kind of felt that way of I growing up, I was always told, and this kind of goes back to what you're talking about as far as like, people not fitting in the box that the majority of society, if you will, wants you to go into. But I was always told I looked at the world a different way. And that's not like, oh, Tyler, that's so fucking cool that you do that. No, the reason I said no. it's like, no, no, it's like, it. <laughs> it's like <laughs> it was it was more of like, I did not understand how people could not see the world the same way. I didn't get it. But yeah. I, I think one of the things you talk about going back to people is that if you do have a mental illness or you, or you are a bird of a feather, go find those people. Every time I've talked to somebody who is bipolar, there's an overwhelming sensation that I, I really can't explain. It's almost like being home where I don't have to say shit. This person knows me. Like we get, we have the same language. And I think no matter what that is, like you kind of said, you need to go be a part of that instead of trying to fit in with somebody else. Because your mental health is not just one uh, finite thing. It comes in buckets. It's different. It's evolving. It's different than uh, everybody else's. Um, and, and what's healthy about flattening our peaks and valleys? Like, is that healthy to flatten? Like, that's the thing I kind of worry about, about medicating. And I may end up doing it, you know, and in my own ways, I have self-medicated in, you know, the various ways that I'm not going to say I'm bipolar because I have not been diagnosed, but I've been also trying to avoid maybe a diagnosis because the thing I don't like about do. Well, because the moment you hear about anyone talk about my ex was bipolar, my mom was, they, all they say is like, this person fucking sucked to live with. This person, like, they're just like a fucking nightmare. Like, it really, this, like, the, the, the around bipolar, that word, when I found out manic depressive was bipolar, because I had always thought of myself as manic depressive, but I'm like, oh my God, I can never, 
admit to that because the moment I say that, no one's going to take anything I say seriously ever again, you know? It's Something that I bonded with somebody recently, a new friend, and we were going all into the works and all these ideas and everything. And I love people who can look at things from multiple sides and not just automatically take the societal template as fact, you know? And people get there through finding meaning in all of this and self-reflection. And I think people who feel at odds with the template reflect a lot more, maybe because of that, like that, that tension. And that is where innovation art and other things come out of, you know, and, and the world does change. And a lot of the things that were status quo, like lobotomizing people that were just a little hard to deal with because in their families didn't want to, you know, like those, those solutions, you know, like we're, we're, there will be, there's some form of a something that the today's equivalent of lobotomy that in a year or two years or some medication we're all taking that suddenly we're going to find out, oh my God, actually it's like way worse for you than ever. So medicine is sort of like, it's, it's being figured out and figure it out as we go. And I don't know, like, I think just, I'm not saying don't, everyone should do what they need to do. And I think there's nothing wrong with taking medication for mental stuff because we take medication for body stuff. You know, if, we, if we're learning more about the body and how to stay healthy, that's great. And we should be aiming for health. But I also don't like who's deciding what health is. And are they just a bunch of type A? Like, I don't know. Anyway, I'm rambling now. No, you're, you're no, no, this is fine. This is good. Uh, you don't you have to censor yourself. really fast and well, bouncing off the walls. Well, no, I mean, no, you're fine. I mean, <laughs> I mean, medication does help. I, I will tell you this from my perspective and I, and uh, yeah. I, I'm starting to do some volunteer work where I'm going to go out and present. And one of the things they're like hammering home with us is always speak from the eye. Cause that's don't, don't, you know, like save for others. So I, I always try and say for I, when it comes to medication specifically that the medication I take works for me. But mm -hmm. to, your point, to your point, and I've talked about this a lot on the show, it does not work for ever, other people. Sometimes it is yeah. not a good thing. I'm a person that can be on lithium. A lot of other people should not be. And there's another side to that, that while I can be medicated, and you kind of talked about flattening the peaks and the, and the valleys, um, I still have to put in the other work for the other part of my medication, which is a lot of what you've been speaking to about finding my people, finding my creativity, finding out the methods that I can use, like the free writing you mentioned when I wake up, that can also be part of my medicine, not just one pill to fix it all. Um, I will say, going back to something that you did talk about that I, I wanna, it, it kind of got into imposter syndrome, which I know a lot of us feel, but there is something kind of dangerous with, with these manic episodes, because you talked about that author trying to get in that window when she was too drunk I found for me, and I know that some other people can probably relate to this as well, is that when I stopped really using, I did find my creativity lacking. And I don't know if it lacked, but I think it was hiding somewhere else. And it's taken mm -hmm. me a little bit to kind of find where that is. Um, well, you were changing your process. Right. And so, uh, well, yeah, people can kind of get lost in that as well. Well, and not only do you sometimes have to change your process, depending on, you know, let's say it's not healthy for you to get that, get there that way anymore. You also have to change, you have to constant, I feel like life is this sort of constant search for motivation too. And that changes, what motivates you changes over time. And then you might find that you get a block or you get depressed or whatever, because the things that were working before weren't working for you. And that doesn't always mean, you know, drugs and alcohol. It can mean money, you know, maybe money drove you for years right. and then, it, at some point you have more money than you ever thought you'd have and okay that's not the thing anymore like you what do you need with an buy another car like whatever you know like or you wanted attention and then at some point you just run out of your need for attention and then you're like well what that was the thing that was getting me up in the morning so finding your finding your why like the simon sinek book or whatever like have you i feel like you've got to kind of constantly redefine that also you know your motivations in the first place and I, I don't know, I hear you on the medication thing, but I, and I, but I also agree with you that there are all these other methods and ways to process and find meaning in our worlds. And art comes out of that process a lot of the time, you know, and it can work to really lift your spirits in a way that doesn't require drugging yourself or changing your brain chemistry. I agree. Um, I, I think it's, it's, it's a tricky situation. That's why we always talk about on the show, like you need to go get multiple opinions you don't have to be hooked on a medication. This isn't it. Like you should try different things. Um, That's true. But tonight is about my opinions. What was that? I guess about my opinions. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of delusions of grandeur. 
um, but okay, getting back to our the whole point, because this was our conversation when we were at coffee. Yes. Uh, when you were talking about how in your form of bipolar, you don't have as many of the peaks, you have a lot more of the valleys. Correct. Yes. That's and correct. I have some friends, actually, the, the first time I really encouraged me, or he, so a friend of mine kind of like casually diagnosed me um, as being bipolar. And I had never really thought of it like that. I thought of manic depressive, but I didn't know that that was the same thing. And I just assumed it was what, ha- what everyone went through, you know, like ups and downs. That's life, you know, in my, in my opinion. Uh, that's how I felt growing up. I didn't really examine it too much. But uh, he was like, well, you're talking really fast. Are you, are you bipolar? Are you talking really fast? Are you going manic? Like, and he, he made it like this really big thing. He never really experienced that. He only experienced depression. And so for him, he was kind of like down or like concerned for me or worried and figuring I need to really get a grip on it. And for me, it's like, God, I love, I love getting like zippy. Like I, I, and granted, I don't think like, well, yes, it does lead... Some of the most amazing moments in my life, the most intense euphoric, like I felt like I had a direct connection to the spirit of the universe. You know, like I felt like pure love for everyone around me. And I felt fully like where I should be in the world doing exactly what I should do. Like one of those rare moments when everything just like, like a ray of light coming down from the heavens or whatever. Um, And I like, I would never take that back, but it was definitely, it was like after, a bunch of really intense, awesome, amazing work that built up to this big culmination of a moment, you know, and to to ever take that back, like I would never, oh God, I would, I like some of the best moments in my life came out of that. Granted, I, I was also, you know, what I do for a living is dangerous. And even the process of going like that job in particular was the most dangerous job I was ever a part of. Like there was like big chunks of ice being cut overhead with the potential to drop somebody had already like fallen off some scaffolding and broken his ribs there were big chunks of ice on the ground everyone's running around with chainsaws we're trying to work quickly you know the it's getting warmer and everything's dripping and melting and like there was really so many things that like could have gone wrong you know and i guess sometimes maybe the, the the mania does help me just like do them you know because of this belief in or like faith this crazy buzzy faith in oneself and faith that things will work out, you know? Well, I think I can relate to that. I'm sure a lot of other people can, that there are times where it's not necessarily like flipping the switch because you can't really control it. And I know with my bipolar, I mean, there's mul- there's different types of bipolar uh, where you can have uh, extreme manic phases that can sometimes lead to hospitalization, uh, hospitalization or, or self-harm, which are really dangerous. Uh, you can have mine where I, I talk about like I'm, I'm the Hulk where my secret is I'm always sad. Um, but I know there have been moments in my career, at least from a professional standpoint and creative, that I let myself be manic sometimes. I tap into that to let yeah. myself perform, to let myself get up. Sometimes it runs away with me. And I, I'm not here to diagnose you on the show at all, but I mean – Delusions of grandeur, thrill seeking, <laughs> racing thoughts. Here's the counter argument to that. What's wrong with grandeur and thrill seeking? There's like, not. Look, there's... At, look at these fucking great artists. If they didn't have that, then would we even have that art? And isn't that like, as far as everything you can get done on the planet before you die, do you want to like mute yourself to blend in and make people around you feel better? Or do you want to reach your full potential? And if, I don't know, like, and do you, and if you fuck too much with your brain chemist, I don't know. I'm probably being a total pain in the ass right now and in the opposite of direction of what you're aiming for with this podcast or with no, this no, show. No, 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 I want real. That's so you're fulfilling well, that I in a think big way. That some of these people out, they, not to say this was great for them, it, but a lot of times where they got really depressed or flamed out, wasn't, you can't just blame it on their brain chemistry. You got to blame it on the world around them. That was like that they, they were impoverished, even though they're one of the like genius, like Van Gogh being like a fucking genius, but you know, doesn't get to enjoy any of his success. So he's like dies and then he's famous for it. Now there's so many stories of that. Forward thinking individuals, they were 20 years ahead of their time, 30 or 50 years ahead of their time. that couldn't relate or connect with anyone. Dying, misunderstood and alone and poor. Yeah. Were they, should they have tried to fix themselves to fit in and get a job as a farmer? No. Or should they produce this fucking amazing work that has a real meaning on the planet? And it and it was a personal sacrifice of their life, but they have a legacy that lives beyond their life. It's just kind of each uh, to each their own, right? Um, I think all of this is a double-edged sword, and I think the one hard thing with all of it is balance, which any mentally ill person will tell you is tough to find balance. Yeah. Uh, it's hard to figure that out. But well, I like. But Go ahead. Yes, but there's also yes, I agree with you, 
And it's harder for people that are riding the waves of <laughs> this, kind of, except they might be very intuitively connected to the things that are happening. And there are moments like in my more up moments where I'm working a room and working a crowd and making connections and finding leads that lead to things where there is a balance, absolutely. But that's sometimes beyond your control too. It's like, just because you have this brain chemistry doesn't mean that all these wild moving parts, like the last two years we've had this pandemic, we've had all the most extreme weather that anything has ever been recorded in history. Like there's some real shit happening right now. And if, if we're feeling a little unbalanced, you know, there's a reason for that. You know, the whole world feels a little bit skewy. And I do think, I, I think in general, everyone is creative. And in, in some way or another, somewhere they have the, the everything, every, we all have create creativity. It's part of our human nature. And I also think we all need therapy because life is hard. But do we change yes. our brain chemistry or consider that the way our brain works is wrong because it doesn't fit in with everyone around us or the, the majority of people around us who, don't struggle with this perspective. Well, I don't think it's necessarily, uh, I've never thought of my bipolar as being wrong. I feel like, or we'll not talk about huh? <laughs> but not even necessarily broken. I just think it's a thing. I do think though, uh, and it's not to come back at you with this, but I do think one of the things you mentioned, circumstance and life. Sometimes I think it is best I, I, for, okay, for you and I, we are we are similar in that we want to leave a grand mark on the world and chase the grand things. I mean that's I mean Hunter S. Thompson kind of said the same thing. Do you want to mm -hmm. you know show up to uh, the pearly gates you know not a speck of dust on you or do you want to slide in like you're sliding into home, bruised and battered and bloody, saying God damn I want to do that again. I get that, but for some people just living in the circumstance that they are is very difficult to do, which is where they do need that medication to help. But I think no matter where you are, kind of going back to talking about community and being around and finding your people, medication or not, that's one of the most important things is to find help that way. Yeah. Yes. If we look at, yes, for sure. I mean, are we talking about, what are we talking about? Right? We're talking about how we're making delusions of grandeur work for us. Are well, we, we talking about? <laughs> we're talking about it all now. <laughs> Get out of it. All right. So my point only is here that, uh, like, I just want to like eat. Like I just want to eat life. I want all of it. Like I love life. I want to every moment, as many moments as I can get myself out of bed to do something. I want to like feel like it has some meaning and that it's going somewhere and that it has lots of potential. And and I don't know. Like I think that this personality type that I have. Let's can we call it a personality type? Maybe. Absolutely. Yes. All right. Cool. Let's just call it that instead <laughs> we of. We don't have to put it in a box. Your extreme mental illness that you should be ashamed of. No. Get in the closet and take your lithium. You know, like I'm sorry, I'm being really rude. <laughs> no, you're not. I get it. I I I have never really once in my life felt like uh, I've only gotten to the point where I can talk publicly and like other people can about their mental illness. I don't feel any shame of it. Uh, I know some other people do, but to your point, yeah, you shouldn't have shame. It's part of who well, I am, and I it's part of my personality. I'm, I've got plenty of shame around lots of things, mostly my actions, you know. The, the, the trick is how do you get a grip on yourself and not become just the big piece of shit that nobody can relate to? But I also think, and actually I was talking about this with a friend, the people that are too smooth, that can just say the right thing in every situation, that never ruffle anyone's feathers or whatever, I mean, that's great, but but you don't really know them necessarily. And like, like we talked about, you know, people, surgeons and certain types where associate more sociopathic brain types are highly successful because they can cut out the emotion and everything. But then in their personal lives, it's kind of like a nightmare. I don't know. There's all these different personality types working. And then some of them are more successful in certain ways than others. And I think in general, we're always looking at these things through the lens of somebody with a nine to five job that wants everyone to, you know, and you look, even just as a freelancer, trying to go and fit into all the forms out there and things and like trying to even fill out, like, how do you even identify what you do in a world that it wants everything in a little box, you know, like, I do. yeah, I think we can, I, yes, some of us have some issues. I mean, most of us have one issue or another. <laughs> Griffin, we all got issues. <laughs> We're all trying to survive here, but don't, ass I just, my, what I'm trying to say is don't assume automatically that it's your fault and your brain chemistry's fault that things aren't just 
super easy and happy. And it's, you know, like, I think that in general, people like, well, look at like favorite characters in television shows and everything. People kind of like people that are a little dumb. Like they like the characters that are a little bit like dumb, funny, non-threatening, little happy-go-lucky dumb. Like those are the most popular characters. And I think that's kind of true societally too. You know, if you're a little bit just like pleasant, you're not ruffling feathers, you're not constantly being a contrarian like some of us, you know, like certain things, like I'm always looking at the other side. I love these conversations. You should totally feel have, feel free to push back on all the things I'm saying, you know, like I like that stuff, but you know, my personality type has maybe been described in some negative ways that would imply that, that I'm like off base and weird or whatever, but. <laughs> uh, that's to, to each individual to say if you're off base. Uh, I think this is one of the reasons I wanted to get you on the show is because, uh, not because you're a contrarian just to be one, um, but it's no. good to have different perspectives about all of this because I feel that one conversation that has been put in a box and you've touched on it multiple times during this episode is mental health. And I'm looking to bust that wide open and you are helping us and do so. So I appreciate it. Um, and I think there's a well, lot. Go ahead. To your point earlier, when you were talking about like Michelangelo and all these different mm -hmm. characters in history, would we want to go back in time? Let's say we had a time machine. Would we go back in time and be like, would anyone feel comfortable going back in time and saying, hey, take this, take this, take this will help with that. I mean, would we mess with that? I mean, no, I would not take the bottle away from Hemingway. I would probably get him another. Or just I just watch him from the corner of the bar. Yeah, and I mean, him do I mean his thing. yeah, they're eventually all humans end, right? But and then how they live I mean, I'm not yes, everyone should get the help they need. Everyone everyone needs help. In my opinion, we all this is all hard. Life is hard. There I mean, that's why religion exists, you know, like and, and honestly, and this is kind of how I feel and not, not obviously medicine is science based. There's like a method there, there's a process and they're trying to improve, but throughout history, medicine has not gotten it right all the time. And a lot of times it's these authority figures making decisions for people and telling them this is the right way to be. This is, this is what's considered normal. Let's take out your uterus because you're acting, you know, pissed, you're acting bitchy. Let's pull out your uterus, you know, like it's kind of fad based and in some ways similar to religion. And then it's like, identifying you as wrong or your basic nature is wrong so you always feel guilty and you always have to answer to them and they have control over you not yeah. that i'm paranoid don't take this as paranoia <laughs> I, i'm not no i think what you're speaking to a lot of people will actually feel very encouraged by and, and i think the message you've been given a lot today uh is inspiring that even if you do clinically have a disorder there is nothing wrong with you your nature is not messed up you're still yeah. a human being with a spirit and a soul, and it shouldn't, you know, put you in chains for the rest of your life or just what you can't even control. So I appreciate you coming on and saying that. Well, next time you feel that little manic burst, try to try to get some work done. Oh, man, <laughs> I, I have not felt a manic burst <laughs> in a minute. Uh, I, I'm in one of those circumstances right now where I, I do feel like a cage bird. And I think a lot of people can relate to that with what's going on with the pandemic of just not being able to get out of our, our, our little tiny places and fly like we want to, but we can't. Um, yeah. And, and a lot of people have suffered from depression, even people that norm normally don't because it's circumstances we can't control. And that makes, it makes us really uncomfortable to be dealing, excuse me, in a very extended, in a, for an extended amount of time with circumstances we don't like and can't control. Yeah. Oh, something I wanted to, to add to what you said, um, around the idea of, oh shit, I just lost my train of thought. It was a good one too. Oh, well, it's Here, gone for now. Let me hit you with a question. We'll see if it comes back to you. Um, okay. So, so I truly believe um, that creativity can save lives, not only just like when you are living your life, but when you're down and in the darkness, because what do we do? We always strive to get out of that. We'll watch something that feels good, that sounds good. It's a favorite song, movie, TV show. Do you have any of those? What What is your like go to art when you need to get out of that place? Oh, I love comedy. I've always loved comedy. And I think it comes from maybe being well, I mean, I've always loved comedy. And I think maybe just I, I just love it. Um, and I hardly ever watch drama if I can avoid it. It's hard because sometimes I'm with people and I'm trying to be like accommodating. But God, I hate it when people put drama on. I'm like, life is full of drama. You know, I want some like 
comedy or some like outrageous horror or something like I, but comedy yeah usually inspires me but smart especially actually this is yesterday I was trying to get myself motivated and I had a bunch of like just stuff I didn't feel like doing like paperwork type stuff and I put on School of Rock Jack Black's School of Rock <laughs> that movie actually is like a perfect movie and it's super inspiring you know this whole like you know fight the man you know don't you know don't give up keep chasing your dreams you know, you're not making money at this. Who cares? Doing it for the love. I didn't do it for the grade. I didn't do it for the money. I did it for the love, you know? You and I watch very different movies when we're depressed. I watch Shawshank Redemption. You're watching what? something funny. <laughs> That's why you out. don't have mania. You got to kick that mania into gear. You got to do some work to get, you know, get the upswing. <laughs> oh, Man, that's... I really wish I could remember what it was I was going to tell you because I feel like it was super relevant here. Um, I'll just keep asking you more random questions. Uh, what are you working on right now? I know uh, you kind of touched on a, a, a few things here tonight, uh, but what are you working on right now that our audience would be interested to hear about? Uh, well, I'm doing a mix of things. So um, I'm started in, can I talk about? Because I don't want you to get like blocked or anything. And it's... You don't have to talk about anything. I, I mean, I don't think oh. you'd get me in trouble. Well, this for is anything. live, so you can edit it if you want to. Anyway, so I uh, recently started in OnlyFans. But I've been noticing you mentioned that or even have a link to it, hidden in a link, hidden in a link. If it's anywhere, they can block and ban you. And I've been really amazed at the discrimination that's come through that. Um, and that's another thing that's benefiting from some of my moments of mania, especially when it triggers my sex drive. And my creativity and sex drive are totally entwined and overlapping. Um, and that does get a little bit risky when I, when I have those wild moments and <laughs> want to yeah. eat the whole world, you know, like um, get conquest minded, I suppose. Uh, yeah, so that... I do, you know, I, I see some parts of myself that definitely gets very like, mm. there's this song I always think of from my youth. Um, there's a band in Oregon. I used to go see shows at all the time. It was a local band called Floater. And they what, had this hold song. Hold on, time and, out. You kind of cut out right there. What, what was it called? Oh, there's this song. And I don't know why this is occurring to me. This is not what I was going to tell you. There's a song that I related to in my youth that was by this band in Oregon I grew up going to see with my friends, like this industrial band in the 90, late okay. 90s called Floater. And they had this song and there was this line in it. <clears throat> Can I sing it to you actually? Oh my gosh, yes. Let me get, hold on, All let right. me put you full screen. I'll sing it to you. I just need a drink of water. Okay. What will they say when you're gone that you conquered, that you burn like a rocket from the womb to the world? And you ran with your colors and your flags unfurled. And that you ignited everything like a gasoline rain. Will they say you were insane while their life is drained? Anyway, it's a line from the song. And I always related to it. <laughs> we can't really cheer on this show. I don't, I don't have sound effects <laughs> for an applause. But if I did, that's where I'd put it in right there. That was beautiful. You got a heck of a voice right there. I didn't know you could sing. Oh, thank you. Yes, nope. I'm a creative type. I, I like that. Will they say you're insane? Uh, AKA a crazy one, you know, a creative. Mm, one of those crazy. Not fitting into that box. <laughs> I told people you were crazy, crazy talented, though, uh, before you came on the show. Um, and I think that is such an inspiration. Like, I, I think a lot of the things you talked about tonight, um, I always tell our folks like to look for nuggets. And I think you, you dropped a ton that people can well, pick up kind of, kind of the upside of mental illness or and, and i'm trying to you know let's i'm trying to take illness but not to say that it's not real and i'm not I, like i said i think everyone is fucked up we're all trying to survive mm -hmm. being the problem is not a pro, the problem is and this applies to society too but also the individual we are humans have evolved to a certain level but we're not fully evolved yet. Like we're still in the process. And so our minds, and this is from Eckhart Tolle, Power of Now, but he talks about the mind being, it's almost like a disease because it's a tool, and but we've placed our identity into it. But it really, it's just like everything else, like our whole body, all of this is like us, right? And in whatever way that means, like in a, kind of at the Buddhist, he's sort of semi-Buddhist in his perspective of really we're more of the observers. The thoughts and the feelings and all of that are kind of like the the surrounding world and how it, it's affecting and reflecting and how what we're picking up and making an identity out of this little quilt of our experience. Um, but that we can get too wrapped up in our minds. And then if we let our minds go crazy and take over, like um, just spin and spin and spin, right? Like our, if our minds, our minds are great problem solving tools. But if we don't take control of that tool, it will create, if it doesn't have a problem, it will create a problem. 
it needs to be constantly solving problems because it needs to feel active and alive. And then, so that's why also that he also says that, this is, that to the to the mind being wrong equals death, which is why people argue and why they can't come to conclusions because the moment somebody, you tell somebody they're wrong, they're going to shut down and their brain is going to fight it because they it can't be wrong because that equals death to the mind, which I think is there's a lot to that actually in that book. That's a great book if you want to try to, as far as another resource out there for people who are struggling and he talks a lot about his own struggle. He had his breakthrough where he became a guru through uh, a moment where he was really close to committing suicide, where he, and he talks about, he says, I cannot live with myself. And then in that moment, he was like, I can't live with myself. Why is there another self here that I can't live with? Like, what does that mean? And then it, it got him into thinking about what the self mean in the first place. I think that's a thing we could all reflect on. I try and figure that out every single day. I have no idea who I'm supposed to be. And I think a lot of people say that to themselves almost on a daily basis. Maybe not a well, daily basis, but every once in a while, like, who the heck am I? Is this really my final form? Is this what I need to be? Well, and he says, too, one of the ways to cure or to get control over the mind or not let it rule you or not get too much identity placed in it. Because the, the identity you place in your mind is also sort of your ego. It's this built up, fragmented thing of identity that you form mostly from the shit that's just like flown at you randomly while you're just trying to get through life. And then if you put too much identity into that, it can be really, um, it can be really fragile and hollow, you know? Um, but one of the ways he says, to, and this is something that we all kind of know um, by now, but one of the ways he says to get out of the mind and be healthier is to get into the body. And so a lot of people do this through exercise. And that's one of those like cure-alls when you're feeling bad is to exercise. So that's another one of those tricks that I do. And I just started going back to the gym actually to try to get the spirit going again. Plus COVID, you know, like I was just, I just sat around and I think that's partly contributed to being depressed. I probably should have tried to stay more active, but. Oh no, I, I, I think it was huge. People were made to move. You were made to walk. Um, so that's awesome that you're going back to the gym. I'm trying to do that myself, get back in there. Cause that was kind of like my religion. One of the biggest com um, combative forces that I had against my mental illness was being able to do that. I can't imagine life with not being able to move, at least for me. Um, yeah, for sure. But that's also kind of a, another one of those things that I'm privileged to have a able body to be able to do that and yep. be able to have a physical job and all of that. And there are plenty of people out there, especially during COVID, who just couldn't risk even leaving the house, you know? No. no. Um, man, dropped. You just, it was just a bombardment of truth bombs tonight, which I can, I am so appreciative of. And I know our audience is too. Um, that was tremendous. I, I love that unique perspective on all that. I think you really spoke to us needing to think about more when it comes to uh, mental illness, which by the way, I'll tell you, this is, this is encouraging. I don't use it enough on the show and I need to, uh, but they are trying actually from a national level here in the States to change mental illness to brain disorder to get rid of the <laughs> mentally ill, you know. Disorder sounds worse. The illness sounds like something you can get over. Disorder sounds like. Well, I, well you know, Griffin, I don't, you know, okay, I'm not, I'm not working at the national level. I don't I don't know what to tell these people. We're, we're, they're trying. We're, we're heading in the uh, right direction, okay? Well, th that's actually what you, this whole even idea of disorder, disorder. Don't fit into the box. You're out of order. Like how about how about we could call it a, being a, you. a brain boo boo? How about that? Does that work? I don't know. I don't know. I'm I'm kind I am a contrarian, but this is kind of how I see. I feel like we should in general be looking at all angles of things, you know, because we are growing up. And this is another thing that kind of like getting back to the Eckhart Tolle. We are our minds and our identities are wrapped up in the things that are shoved at us in our faces. You know, and our parents and, and the television shows we watched and the shit are, that somebody said to us when we were 12, like all that stuff becomes like part of these identities, especially his whole thing is about the pain body. We form an identity too. There's this parasitic, psychic monster inside of us called the pain body, which is sort of this identity that forms from every little thing that ever hurt you, that anyone ever hurt you. And then when something triggers that, it flares up and it needs to feed. And it, usually at the end, you feel totally exhausted and you've made a situation worth and everyone kind of gets drained from that. And I'm super guilty of that. Uh, I have a hard time. Uh, I don't really have anxiety. I think that's partly why I can boldly go forward um, is that I don't struggle with anxiety, but I dwell on the past a lot. But I also think that dwelling on the past, as much as it tortures the people around me but, and myself, it's also in, as far as physics goes, the past is still exists. And all, everything, all of that exists, still, it still exists. And I think sometimes we get hung up on this idea that you need to let go of the past 
you need to get into get into a right mode where you're always in a pleasant mood. You need to get like you've got to do all these things to fit in. And I feel like for that we if we can still hold the past, not let it ruin us, but hold on to the past as far as lessons go, you know, or the meaning of things, or learning and building into the meaning of things. The downside of that I think is because of that pain body, the memory of those things, anything that went wrong becomes it influences the future. So that's kind of the bummer. And I found that with relationships to be very hard, you know, to start new ones now, knowing more and seeing red flags and everything. But so how did like, just trying to, I guess, like cope with the past, but learn from it too. And not just like try to dismiss all of these things that are maybe not comfortable, but, but, but give depth and meaning like even the sad moments. I'm sorry, this is kind of going along. And if are you trying to wrap me up here? I'm not trying like, to wrap you up now. If you think of here's how I think of the ups and downs. If you look at like a photograph, and like like here, like this is a photograph. If I had like the light over here turned up way more, like if I'm gonna go, I want to go full happy. I don't want to have the dark side. I don't have the depression at all. It's it's just this sort of whitewashed brightness of of flat flatness, maybe of a shallow flatness. If you look at an image, you know, it's the shadows, the darks, the moments of sadness. It's those things that kind of add definition and also help you relate to other people in the future with empathy. I mean, you look at it like a lot of the people who are in therapy or therapists started because they needed to figure out their own mind and then they use that to help heal others, you know? So I think that, yes, it really sucks to go through these downs and then maybe the highs can be a little dizzying or whatever, but the highs can be motivating and the lows, they suck and definitely don't dwell on them to the point where you try to self-harm, but there are going to be moments in life that are hard and suck. And then sometimes we can't really, it's circumstances that are beyond our control. That's very true. Um, I, I, th I think that works as far as uh, that message of, listen, you have to take the bad with the good because you have to, that's the human experience. You don't have yeah. a choice and maybe preparing yourself, which is difficult to do. I mean, I still can't do it. I consider myself a relatively strong person, but I get crippled by the littlest things still that are because of my past and I know that's something I got to work on but um I'll tell you what I, I don't know if you're contrarian but um I, I think your differing opinions and your different way of looking at this is what we need on the front lines of mental health I won't say mental illness anymore we'll just keep it at mental health yeah why uh, don't we try to be positive about this mental health <laughs> we all have to deal with this life and nobody has got it I mean that's what I was trying to say essentially humans are evolving and not only humans, but the societies that we are in are evolving. And they're not at a fully realized place yet. And and we are doing our best in this process. And, and, and it kind of can feel daunting wherever where you look, people are looking at anything that's not in order as an illness or a disorder or whatever. But I think it's just we're 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 all sort of evolving. The world is evolving. It's all, we're all trying to get somewhere. And even the societies we live in now, like I'm in Texas and Texas did made a whole bunch of rules here that are real messed up. And I feel way out of line in the place. I mean, I feel like not comfortable in my skin here at all. And that bums me out and it makes me angry and everything. But I don't know that my anger and bum out is my fault in the situation, you know? In this particular situation, which we probably can't get into, uh, no, it is absolutely not your fault. Um, you can it, feel out of place in the, pla the place that you're in, and it doesn't necessarily mean that it's your brain that's broken. It, that is very true. I think the one thing that you just said right there as far as, far as like society evolving, this conversation right here is part of that, and what we're trying to do on this show is part of that. And there's so many other people that are trying to make this conversation uh, something that we can all talk about to where you don't have people saying, well, that's wrong and you need to get back in line uh, and quit that way of thinking. So I appreciate you coming on the show tonight, Griffin. I know our audience does. They have a lot to think about and digest. I do too. I love having you on. <laughs> it was a ton of fun. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm yeah. all around up. No, you're good. And if you think about what you're going to ask me, just shoot me a text. We'll figure it out. We'll, we'll, do, we'll do a Griffin episode part two. Yeah, I don't know what it was. I, actually, I think it had to do with this idea about humans evolving because I've been thinking about this a lot lately. I mean, and I've been thinking about it more from the relationship perspective, but that's like a whole other episode. I well, can't even start that conversation with you. Well, then, okay, we'll put a we'll put a pin in it and then we'll come back for part two. We'll do one down the road about uh, relationships evolving because 
I mean, I would love to hear more about that. This was a this was a treat having you on tonight, so I appreciate it. Well, thanks. All right, uh, we will catch you uh, uh, later down the road. Do you have anything else uh, to announce before you go, or anything else you want to leave our audience with? Oh, um, hmm. no, I don't think so. Um, oh yeah, you asked me the things I was doing. The other thing, I guess, I'll just mention and plug, or it's something to look out for for me in the future. Is that part of how I'm getting my mental health right, and why partly my downs over the last several years is because I've been picturing myself in the forest. And now it's partly through this like drive and hyper fixation. Maybe you could call it OCD. I don't know. It's finally happening and becoming a reality. And so now there's 225 acres of solid earth that I can go play in and make into a reality that starts with wild ideas that don't fit in in the city I live in and that need to go somewhere. So uh, that's what I want to leave off on, I guess. It's like delusions of grandeur, making mania work for you. This is my title. <laughs> Would, that will be the episode title because you're going to yeah, text me and you're going to be like, Tyler, why didn't you name it what I wanted you to? No, no, I'm just kidding around. So this desire, this like this uh, gasoline rain, right? What will they say when you're gone that you conquered? This this desire, this delusions of grandeur is going to make this place happen. And this place is going to inspire other people. And it's going to be a real solid thing that people can exist in. Like that's that's the human brain. And so when you feel these bursts of energy and motivation and the, the same bursts of energy and motivation and brain chemistry that got Michelangelo to paint this paintings, like let's not automatically assume it's wrong. That's a good, good, uh, good message to leave with. I appreciate that. And uh, our audience does too. And I look forward to coming up there. I, I, I want to see if we can't maybe do some mental health things up there in your well, absolutely and freakonomics on npr like last week if you guys want to check out something cool just did a whole segment on how pollution is actually really harming our brains so another thing of as far as our brain health and mental health there's, there's pollutants all around that we're not even being warned about that are having an effect on our brain and it's often based on where you live in town which is based on the money you have yeah uh, so is that an invitation for all of us to hop on up there during the apocalypse well, yeah, that's kind of future proofing for this apocalypse because I'm thinking <laughs> what's happening. It's not paranoia. There's plenty of evidence. Listen, we, we might Thanks be a good. small community here on How Are We Today, but we are a resourceful, very positive people. So I think we could help out with the camp. Just just throwing that out there. Oh, definitely. No, we're going to be hosting lots of things. There'll be some um, cool opportunities for that. And I, I feel like my mental health improves immensely when I get into nature. And that's something that Julia Cameron mentions in her book, The Artist's Way, too. I think, and especially now that I know, based on this NPR Freakonomics from last week, these pollutants and like the city life and this air that we're breathing, these, these particles in the air, are actually hurting our brain, not just our bodies, but they're making us dumber. They're dumbing our brains down. And over time, in generations that are stuck in these neighborhoods, that it's and it's really divided based on money they're having the worst effects of all absolutely they don't have any green there that's that's another episode that'll be griffin episode yes, part about. three we have that'll be part three after part two relationships evolving <laughs> this is great my friend i appreciate it um yeah, fun. yeah thanks again uh we'll we'll touch base with you soon and uh yeah our audience is going to want you back so you, you we got to get you back on the show one of these weeks Okay, cool. I'm around. All right. Griffin Ramsey, everybody. Griffin, we'll see you later. Bye, guys. Oh, that was great. Tremendous. Okay, good. I'm going to see you oh, man. Um, okay, guys. That was good. That was awesome. Now, uh, some of you might not have agreed with everything Griffin was talking about, but I think that's why she's one of the... Um, one of the people that we kind of need to be a part of this conversation is to get those different perspectives, uh, not get cookie cutter and get people thinking outside the box. And hopefully a lot of you guys picked up lessons today that um, from her, or some things that she said that'll get your brain moving. I think that's one of, that's one of my favorite things about uh, being friends with Griffin is I always get something. Every time I go, I, uh, we go get grab coffee, I come away with a new perspective on something. Um, so I, I saw you guys in the chat tonight, uh, you know, for those of you watching on Twitch, um, really engaged with a lot of the stuff she was saying. The Artist Way definitely is, an, is one of the books. We'll have Dr. Bacon kind of send that information out in our Discord. Uh, that seemed like a really interesting read, something that I definitely think maybe we all should look into 
here on this show is just grabbing more. Just grab as much as we can, as much free information as we can get in this life to make it better. Um, and so, yeah, with this behind me, I wrote this up here definitely with the question because I don't know the answer. And I think Griffin brought that perspective of like, you're not wrong. You're not broken. Would we really change these things uh, in these people and their situations? It, they gave so much. Um, so I don't know. That's still a good question to ponder whether or not. However, this part everybody has. And if you do have this part, you can still have this part. And yes, uh, Rebecca, we might have to do a book club. Um and we'll definitely have to have Griffin back on to talk about some more things. I like getting those type of perspectives on this show because we need raw, we need real to move the goalpost. So hoping to have more guests on like her. That was tremendous. So that'll do it for this episode of How Are We Today? I'll remind folks who are watching the recorded version excuse me, on YouTube or listening on Spotify or any of our other audio platforms. If you stick around or if you watch live and you stick around, uh, we do a post show uh, every episode here on Twitch. So with that, um, you guys better uh, re-listen, re-watch this one. Griffin had a lot to say. Tremendous perspective on a lot of different aspects of creativity, mental illness, just our, our well-being in general, our place in this world and in society not being put into a box, which I think all of us love to hear. Makes me want to run through a brick wall. I don't want to be in no damn box, and neither do you. So thank you guys for joining us. We'll be back next week for another episode. Until then, I hope you have a great week. We'll see you then.